let's start with a question, shall we? What are we really made of? As far as we can see with the naked human eye when looking at the human body, the answer normally ends up being our muscles, organs, or bones. But what happens if we look further inside? We find cells, and within them, our DNA. But we need to go further, all the way down to atoms. Then even further, to the very nucleus of each individual atom. And here we are the beginning of it all. But can we go even deeper within? And what will we find when there's nowhere else to go? Well, that's what we're here to tell you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're Arjun Janan Kranadukkal, and we welcome you to our TED Talk on String Theory, the product of everlasting curiosity. Human beings have thrived for so long only because of the urge to find and to know. This urge will compel us to do anything so that we can receive knowledge. This urge has also led people to ask the question that marked the very beginning of complex human civilization. What is everything made of? This single question has led to the greatest scientific revolution the world has ever seen. The microscopic composition of different substances would go on to determine almost all of the interactions and phenomena that we can observe today. This question, which transformed the field of expanded our understanding of the world by an unfathomable amount, has also led to the postulation of quantum mechanics. Commonly termed the science of the small, quantum mechanics is a study of microscopic particles. It essentially provides a description of the physical properties of nature at the scale of atoms and subatomic particles. The development of quantum mechanics came along as we kept on investigating natural phenomena and got on more and more questions that we had to answer. The first such necessity was identifying the basic composition of matter. After rigorous observation, we described this basic unit as the atom. Then we asked, what is within this atom? We found protons and neutrons, which make up the nucleus, and electrons that revolve around them. But you see, physicists and their theoretical understanding pointed towards another level of particles. So they kept on looking and eventually discovered quarks, which are the particles that make up protons and neutrons. These particles were believed to be the indivisible, uncuttable constituents of the world, also known as elementary particles. Slowly, we found numerous different types of quarks and a variety of other particles as well. Only then did we manage to make a standard model of quantum mechanics in the 1970s. This standard model describes all the elementary particles and the forces and laws that control both their interactions and motion. By now, humans have analyzed the field of quantum mechanics and discovered a concrete and thorough model that acts as the base of all our knowledge. However, its sheer importance doesn't mean that it's entirely untouchable. In fact, Multiple physicists today are trying to fill in the few gaps that remain in this model. They have theorized that quarks are in fact not the final frontier. That's right. There may be something we can identify that resides within quarks, giving them their composition and characteristics as we know it. And what is it? No, it's not another particle. What it may be though, is a length of pure energy that could perhaps take up different forms and frequencies to create these different elementary particles. And what drove them to this conclusion? It was the very focus of our talk today, string theory. But hold up, you may be thinking, what even is string theory? What exactly does it aim to explain? And just how did we get all the way here? To answer those questions, we'll need to take you back in time, all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century. Let us set the stage for you. It's 1905, and you are Albert Einstein. Your clever observation of motion in day-to-day -day life led to the creation of the theory of special relativity, which connects an object's speed to its mass and position. Soon, though, you notice that this theory doesn't include the effects brought about by the force of gravity. This led to the release of your paper on general relativity 10 years later which stated that the force of gravity is simply a series of warps and curves in the dimensions of space and time where matter and energy are present. Essentially, 
any matter or energy that exists creates a sort of valley in the fabric of space, which is otherwise flat. The heavier the mass of the matter, the greater the valley created by it. This is how the sun, approximately 148 million kilometers away from us, is able to keep the earth in its gravitational field. It also enables the moon to stay in orbit around the earth. Once this theory was verified by the use of astronomical observations, Einstein gained greater prominence around the world. His theories became much more widespread and led other physicists fueled by curiosity to spawn numerous similar conjectures. This craze caught the eye of a virtually unknown German mathematician, Theodor Kaluza. Kaluza, like Einstein, was in search of what we call a unified theory. That's one theory that might be able to describe all of nature's forces from one set of ideas or principles. So Kaluza believed that since Einstein had been able to describe gravity in terms of warps and curves in space and time, maybe he could do the same with the electromagnetic force. Kaluza's goal in this aspect was to describe the force of electromagnetic attraction as Einstein did, which was in terms of warps and curves. That raised the question, warps and curves in what? Einstein had already used the dimensions of space and time to, to describe gravity, and there didn't seem to be any dimensions left to warp or curve. This predicament got Kaluza thinking, and he came to a certain conclusion. It may seem bold or bizarre, but there was a certain sense to it. He found more force, he potentially need one more dimension. So he imagined that the world had four dimensions of space, not the three that Einstein used. He believed that electromagnetic attraction was warps and curves in this fourth dimension. Now, here's the thing. When he began to approach this idea with math, the equations perfectly checked out. And while this discovery added to the idea of finding a unified theory for forces, it was still based entirely on the theory. But if you attempt to analyze this from a more practical standpoint, Two questions arise. First off, if there are more dimensions of space, why can't we see them? Secondly, does this theory really work in detail when you try to apply it to the world around us? The first question was answered by a man named Oscar Klein in 1926. He suggested that dimensions might come in two varieties. There might be big, easy to see dimensions, but there also might exist tiny curled up dimensions curled up so small that even though they're all around us, we can't see them. For instance, take a good look at this box that I'm holding up now. Well, to be exact, it's a pen holder. But from your current perspective as a viewer of this presentation and its current orientation, can you really tell that it's a box? No, because as it is, you can only see it from one dimension. This makes it look like a colorful rectangle drawn on a piece of paper. Hence, to see it in a greater number of dimensions, we'll need to alter our perspective. For that, observe the following positions. We have the first dimension of space as described by my finger, top to bottom. Then we can see the second dimension as shown as part of the box, forward and backward. Finally, we have the third and last dimension of space that we can physically see as of yet, left to right. This further illustrates the idea that there might be different types of dimensions and that different perspectives and scales would enable us to see all of them. The same concept applies with an object smaller than us. This idea itself became known as string theory. Now, what about the second question we asked about whether this idea works in the real world? Well, Einstein and many scientists spent years and years attempting to refine this concept and apply it to physics. And it didn't work very well. The calculations just didn't check out. So into the 1940s, it was quite popular, but the lack of mathematical support soon led to the less interest around in it. That was though until our era, when string theory evolved into its new form, super string theory. It's a theory that tries to answer the question, what are the most basic constituents that make up our universe? It aims to go even further than quarks, to 
to explain this idea, let's think about an object familiar to us, a violin. We know that this violin is made up of atoms which contain electrons and a nucleus made up of protons and neutrons. These particles are also made up of individual particles called quarks. This is defined by the standard model and this is where conventional ideas stop. Now superstring theory comes into play. States deep inside these quarks, there is something else, a dancing filament of energy that looks like, say, a vibrating string, hence the name. Just like the vibrating strings on a violin, which you can pluck at different frequencies to produce different musical notes, these strings also vibrate in varying patterns, producing the different particles making up the wall around us. If this idea is correct, this is what the microscopic landscape of the world looks like. It's built up of a huge number of these tiny filaments of pure vibrating energy, vibrating in different patterns to produce different particles that are responsible for all the richness around us. And this now comes back to the basic purpose of string theory, which was to be a unified theory. Because now you see unification as all types of particles, matter particles and radiation particles are built up from one entity, hence matter, and the forces of nature are all put together under the rubric of vibrating strings. Now, to me, that's a truly unified theory. Now, here's the catch. If you attempt to study the math behind this new form of string theory, you'll see that it doesn't work in a, in a universe with just three dimensions of space. It won't even work in a, in a universe with four dimensions. For this controversial idea to check out, we need 10 dimensions of space and one dimension of time. This leads us back to the ideas we discussed from the original string theory, which stated that our world may have more dimensions than the ones we can see. So you might think about that and say, all right, assuming these extra dimensions exist, that too on a scale where we can't even think about seeing them yet, how does it matter to us? More so, how does it matter to the progression of science? Now, that's an important question to answer. And here's why. You may know that in the universe, there are about 20 numbers, 20 values that are the most important constants to ever exist. For instance, the mass of a certain particle or the strength of gravity. If these values were off by even one decimal value, we wouldn't exist at all. Studying these additional dimensions, however, can clue us into why these numbers have their exact values and why changing them ever so slightly would upset the cosmic balance like never before. String theory is meant to unify quantum mechanics with gravity. But to date, there has been no experimental proof for this theory. It suggests that the strings exist in 11 dimensions without knowing how each of the dimensions is compactified. This makes it extremely difficult to even understand how to design an experiment. Multiple physicists currently believe that it is close to impossible to prove the theory. However, the other half is confident in the mathematical insights which are provided by the theory. This belief keeps the theory alive and keeps our hopes alive that it will someday unify all of physics. Even though it has not been able to do that yet, it was still used by physicists to solve problems in quantum entanglement. Now this raises a question. Will this theory ever be proved? Well, it is a possibility because the development of physics can take the wildest of turns. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a quick summary of string theory as a whole. It wasn't perfect, but hopefully it was enough to your interest in a concept that has been both intriguing and elusive for physicists for almost a century now. But what's more important for all of you to pick up, at least in our eyes, is the fact that all of this was only made possible by the wonder that is human curiosity. We could cite hundreds of examples of how this has been crucial to the development uh, of physics over the course of history. Take Einstein, take Kaluza. But in the end, it all boils down to the first humans asking that fateful question so many millennia ago. 
what is everything made of? And from there, it began the era of science. Thank you. <laughs>